Welcome into the unknown realm with your hosts, Steve and Naomi from Stirs Paranormal. Take a journey with us into a world that few understand and even fewer dare to go. On your home for everything wicked at gtmwickedradio.com. My A town. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everybody. This is a very special Into the Unknown Realm uh, Halloween special with Woo! a lot of awesome guests with us today. That's me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, Steve made it. I'm here. But not only did Steve Clark made it, but Steve E made it back to us all the way from his vacation, and he will be manning the chat room. Chatterbox himself over there. And we have... <laughs> He's hot! <laughs> <laughs> He's sporting a lovely tan, which I am jealous of. And uh, we also have very special with us one of our teammates, Dan LaRose. <laughs> very special. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> so, uh, last week was his birthday, and we all oh, ate yeah, our cupcakes, cupcakes for him. Yes, yes, I know. I we, and we literally <laughs> just threw away the other cupcakes. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> Pictures on, you know, just to rub it in my face. I did. Because I was eating it in my face. Yeah, that was yummy. (laughs) Um, As we know, I'm Naomi Gorman. I'm Steve Clark. I'm Brian. I'm Terry. She can't talk very well tonight. She's got almost laryngitis. She's got that flu they caught on The Walking Dead. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm Dan. Where else? And yep, that's Steve. Oh, Steve. Oh. So without further ado, we want to bring on our very first guest with his disclaimer. very... Disclaimer. Oh. What's this? The disclaimer that we're not here to... The things that I've said tonight, we're not here to... Oh, actually, that's for tomorrow. Never yeah. mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, we got way too much going on. Steve's going a little crazy. We're, we're a busy group. But anyways, uh, with us right now, we have the very special Dan Hoven, as seen on Haunted Encounters, School Spirit, Paranormal Challenge, and Resident Undead. Welcome back to Into the Unknown Realm with us, Dan. Hey, how's it going? You guys hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Yep, we can hear you. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome. So... Tell us your most scariest story experience that you have, um, that you can think of, that has uh, happened with you, that you know what I'm talking about. With all your experiences, what was the the thing that scared you out of your pants the most? Um, It was was oddly human. Um, When I was at Pennhurst State School uh, a few Januarys ago, we were filming some stuff for the web series, and... Uh, Jordan and I were actually standing in the hallway. The Mayflower started hearing a loud slamming. We went to look, and it was basically somebody was slamming on the outside door, and we were under instructions not to let anybody in because they had private security there, and we have a phone number. And they were knocking on the door. My biggest fear, I've always said, is um, if there's any squatters or people breaking in, just doing you know, vandalism for vandalists. And so we stood there for about for the half an hour arguing because they said that they were cops they didn't want to give us a badge number. And I had, um, there's actually video footage, I had 20 feet of chain wrapped around my hands as if I couldn't do anything, uh, threatening them while we're waiting on our personal security detail to get there. But it was scary because not only are we at Penhurst in the middle of January, we're alone on that whole campus. For all we know, there's some crazy hobo outside trying to get in. Right, um, yeah. It turned out to be the cop, but I'm from that area, and it doesn't surprise me. Local cops don't feel the need to give you identification, so if somebody says they're a cop, I just don't open the door. And I guess oh. the scariest paranormal, paranormal one would be, um, I would say, actually, at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, just because, you know, I'm pretty sensitized to all this, but I remember getting show in the show with Jordan fell about four feet off a ladder, and that was pretty scary because we were all separated, and we just sort of fought on the walkie talkie. So that was pretty. Uh, Scary for I guess. Wow. Now, um, 
I know like some really creepy stuff has happened to us like at Rolling Hills and you've been there several times. Mm -hmm. And um and you you actually won the paranormal challenge with uh your thing that you did at Rolling Hills, right? Yeah, yeah, I actually got um uh, got pretty scared down there in the basement. Uh, I asked Raymond to um, make a noise, and then something, I don't know what it was, slammed against the sound like the water heater down there, or it was a huge bang, and scared the hell out of me. And that was more of a shock than anything, just because I wasn't expecting it. But, I mean, that was pretty, uh, I was doing this, I'm just like, what have I got myself into? <laughs> yeah, that's definitely one creepy building. Uh, I told Naomi that if uh, she left her gear up on one of those floors like Shadow Hallway, there's no way I was going up there by myself to get it. <laughs> she should go by herself. <laughs> I might have, yeah, actually. I think I might have done that. Yeah, we actually recently were going back over our evidence of Rolling Hills, and we found some more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we um I think we told you about how we saw on Shadow Hallway at the very end, you know, the atrium area at the end with all the windows. And we saw a, a black mass go from right to left. And we both saw it, which was cool that we were both able to see that. And uh we had taken pictures when we were down there in the place, you know, all over and then when we were leaving, that's when we actually saw the shadow. And um, anyways, we took pictures as we were leaving. And now going back on our pictures, we actually caught this uh, white figure. Yeah. Yeah, uh, figure over by that table that has like the Santa Claus and the Christmas tree and all that on there. That was cool. And it's quite large. Um, yeah. And the two faces in the window. In the window. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I think I need to show Sharon that. Uh, I'm sure she would definitely love it. And then when we were leaving, we actually took some pictures. Uh, Steve has a thing with windows. I'm a window looker. Yeah. Not a window licker, but a window looker. <laughs> Not a peeping Thomas either. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but anyways, uh, so he took a picture of the backside near the entrance, but near on the uh, right side of that entrance, the ramp. And uh, we actually caught two pretty good things in this one picture. One is a, a really nice orb on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, in one of the windows, you can actually see two faces. And I'm, I mean, like... You can see the hairline, the different color of hair on both of them. It's, uh, it's actually pretty impressive. As you keep looking at it, you find more and more. Yeah. That's definitely cool. I will say Rolling Hills, and I say that to this day from my experiences just kind of around everywhere. Rolling Hills has always, at least in my experiences, provided the best visual evidence when it comes down to like, pictures and video. Um, it always seems to be the best ones out, so I love that for that. I think it's a uh, more good for visual evidence there. Yeah. I can't wait to go back. I want to get the whole team this time to go, though. Yeah, I'm up for a little trip. You should join us when we go, Dan. Well, I mean, no, I'm in mean, the uh, I'm a Northeast guy, so I'm still you know, only a few hours away from everything. It's a nice luxury. There you go. Well, you know, you're always, uh, you know, you're always um, welcome to join us on anything that we do. So. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I, I actually it's been a little bit since I've done anything kind of big scale like that. I was just I did something for a, a Halloween party. Uh, oh man, eight months ago. So I guess I did it Saturday. Um, I'm in that right now. And uh, I'm about to be doing some next week, but after, after you know, we're going to be up in Ohio next week for Lake County Historical Society, but after that, my schedule is pretty much clean for a month, so wintertime. Really? Uh, oh, you're yeah, on vacation. I, <laughs> yeah. That <laughs> sounds nice, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I, I hibernate during the winter if I can. You know what we're doing on our vacation? We're going to Black Swan. <laughs> Another hunting place. Uh, yeah, we're like, yeah, let's get away. Let's go do something. Uh, let's go to another investigation. Yeah, is that haunted? Uh, let's find out if it's haunted now. Unbelievable. Whatever we go any place. Oh, we got to go do an investigation here. Uh, let's get a hotel that's haunted. That'll be awesome. <laughs> 
But, but yeah, that's cool. So do you have like any other upcoming events? Um, besides the ones you mentioned, I know you do a lot of like fundraising and stuff. Yeah, I work. You know, in the winter time, it's close by. I try to work with historical societies. I'll be. This is actually my third year in a row with the Lake County one. Um, I'll be with there with Michelle Vaughn, Dave Manny's Paranormal State, and Rebecca Hirschbaum from the uh, School Spirits. We'll be up there for that this week, this Friday. Actually, actually it's Saturday, but they uh, texted me today and today was Friday, so I kind of laughed. I'm glad you did that. After that, there's um, there's going to be one more large scale event I'm doing in April. There's still having enough to be talking to me today about it. As far as anything else, I'm kind of on hold. I'm going to be working um, on actually a short film in about a month. It's actually going to be at the Twin City Opera House on my ghost story. I know the uh, United Paranormal Project has done that. They're, we're actually using that one more But um, I'm, right now I'm kind of in a holding period. I don't have to plan. I really can't plan anything. So I've been crazy. So it's actually going to be nice to kind of relax and, uh, I don't know, hibernate till we're out again. Oh, I know. So you going trick-or-treating, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, it was funny. I was I was pulling out my driveway with Rebecca on Saturday to go out to a um, Halloween party I was hosting out there in Ohio, and I felt so bad because I was running a little bit late, and all the computers were out. And I'm like, oh, man, because I don't want to put candy on my porch and leave because then kids like me will take all of it and leave none for the other one. So I was seeing, I was seeing, uh, I just have the children that saw me pulling out my driveway real slowly as they look at my porch and saw I had left nothing for them. <laughs> I felt bad, but I didn't want I didn't want to leave it out because I know one kid would just take all of it. Right. Right. I know here we have uh, in this area, and I don't even know why, but we have trick or treating always on the thirtieth. A lot of neighborhoods do that. Unfortunately, things aren't um, things aren't. I guess nice how they used to be. Yeah. Oh, like, here's a here's a scary story for you. One Halloween in fifth grade, I saw my friend get hit by a car in front of me, and then I oh, hit him. Wow. It, it was funny. You guys are, are you guys will remember? I was actually I was uh, Judge Ito for Halloween. And I remember seeing my friend get hit by a car. I'm like, oh, it was you know. In hindsight, it was funny because his mother made him wear the highlight strips all over his clothes for like the next three years. But um. He's okay. <laughs> That's and he, awesome. And he's good. He walks okay, good now. And <laughs> she still goes about it. God bless the mother. She puts those on everything. <laughs> Reflective tape. Oh, that poor guy. Oh, man. I know. That brings up good, a very, very good point. Uh, everybody, please be careful. <laughs> Of the trick or treaters, drive slow. Please don't kill nobody's kids. You know, uh, stuff like that. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh no. Well, Dan, I am so thrilled that you were able to come on and uh, share your ghost story with us. Oh, our next caller actually just disappeared. That's oh, weird. Oh, thanks for having me. I'll let you guys bring them on. All right. Well, thank you so much, and you have a very happy Halloween. Don't eat too much candy, Dan. Too late. <laughs> Don't too forget late. your reflective tape. We'll yeah. catch you later, Dan. <laughs> Thanks, thank Dan. All right. Good night. <clears throat> Love Dan Hoven. Awesome guy. Yeah. Awesome guy. A lot of stories. He, he's uh, always so uh, funny, um, and I love just talking to him. Um, he's just <laughs> So we're presently waiting for our next caller. We had him, and we lost him. No, actually, uh, we had a... Uh, there he is. Oh, no. This is... This is and sorry, you guys, for the craziness. <laughs> Just begun. Hi, Debbie. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. For our callers, we have with us Debbie Perkins. Debbie! Hey, De- hey Debbie guys. Oh, <laughs> yeah. She is a several-time nominated and winner of Radio Show of the Year. Uh, she's the host and founder of Maine Extreme Paranormal. Correct? You got that right. And also now actress. I am. I am just breaking into the business. Um, and I've, I'm actually in one of the one movie, um, that's filming right now called The Taken. 
um, and I'm up for another part, and we'll, we shall yeah. we'll find out how that works. Um, well, good luck. <laughs> it's well, so weird. It's a complete different uh, atmosphere than what I'm used to. Wow. Well, that's cool. I think that's that's really cool. I would love to do that. I think acting would be a lot of fun. Probably stressful because, you know, everybody has their opinions on how things should be done and, you know. But I think that's cool. I, I haven't experienced any stress yet. Uh, I've met some really nice people here locally, um, and I'm working with a professor. I told you earlier, I was at community college today, um, and I did two lectures, and I just got home from the second lecture, and we were talking about the paranormal, and I was talking to this decent-sized student body of all ages. So let's put it this way. Everybody's going back to get their education. There's, there weren't all just children out there. And right, um, yeah. they were very interested and fantastic. It was just fantastic the way they received me. Um, both classes were uniquely different, but the questions were similar to the same, and they were in depth. And they put me on the spot a few times. So, but I love that. I love being able to be put on the spot when it comes to paranormal. Now, I feel like Debbie, you are the welcoming committee. Like when we went and did the uh, paranormal awards and we were doing the Paracon, Tilton. You, yep, in Tilton, you came right over and you were so gracious and nice to us and and uh, talked with us, and that was awesome. And it's so funny because you asked us to be on your, your show, and here you're on ours. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It's, it's a ton of events that usually, and I think that's how it happens a lot of times, is uh, people connect and they end up um, doing things like I just did um, grab a bunch of people from the paranormal field. On one day, I got 15 people to send me four questions. Two of them were, you're naming your address. The other two questions were on the importance of paranormal. This was all going for a magazine that had to be in by Monday morning. And I got 15 people. Eight of them got put in the magazine. Wow, that's wow. cool. That's awesome. So we all shake each other's hands. And, you know, people don't want to talk about paranormal unity. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to do it. Yep. Absolutely. you got to live it. Absolutely right. So, Debbie, I would love to hear your most scariest ghost story that has happened to you. Oh, my gosh. Um, I don't know if you know, but I, I've had visions, and um, I've had them on and off since I was a teenager. But um, I've used them only little in the paranormal aspect. I'm more scientific like you guys. Um, but what happened was I did go to a location I did have a vision of a woman um, being held down, and the woman's face continued to change. And I was talking to the owner and the psychic at the time, and I was telling them what I was experiencing. And come to find out this room, and I was seeing lots of blood and people in white, and it just didn't seem normal. I thought there was something unusual going on. Come to find out it was used for illegal abortions. Well, we spent the night here in the opposite room, and, of course, in the middle of the night, I have to go to the bathroom uh, like a like a fool. I have to walk past that room, and I didn't want to. I had that gut-wrenching feeling. You guys know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. I just don't want to go there, and I rarely feel that. Well, I ended up going past that, and I, I actually sat in my menstruation, believe it or not, in a room like behind that room because actually the bathroom was considered out of that room at one point in time. It was what it was was the room was split into, you know, two different sections. It was a used as a bathroom and a bedroom. Well, lucky me, I got to experience the full throttle of that investigation on top of having a personal experience and then having it happen to me. So really weird. Really weird. Really scary in a way because I I don't like I don't like uh, unexpected um Mother Nature calls when I uh, just I know I'm on when I'm on schedule I'm an off schedule girl. But that didn't happen to me. So I think that probably scared me the most because it affected me internally. Wow. It had a physical effect. Yeah, well You know, um like we went I don't know if you've gone to the haunted Victorian. I have. And you know the nanny's room? I do. I and saw a lady choked in that room, yeah. The red room you talked about? 
No, it's like right next right to next the, red, door. Yeah. the red room. Right okay. between the red room and the stairwell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. uh, when I went in there and Edwin was giving us the tour, like I just got this awful gut-wrenching feeling in my stomach. And, you know, I tried to stand there, bear it, you know, thinking, you know, you know, it'll pass or whatever. But it was just like almost like I couldn't breathe. And it was just this pain just right in the pit of my gut. And I'm like, okay, I need to, like, go out of the room. There's got to be something in the room. And I did. I went out of the room, went into the doorway, and it went away. So that's the one time I've really, you know, felt, um, you know, what you're talking about. But, um, but yeah. yeah. I do believe there are entities there um, that are still there because they don't believe they've had anybody come in and do a cleansing or anything that, you know, would rid spirit of their home. But I, I know what you're feeling about, but I had the feeling in the room before that where the red room is. Um, mm-hmm. I visualized the woman being choked out in that room. Then we did an EVP session and got a man's name that matched up with one of the historical names of a man that would have been the one choking her. So how cool is that? That's so yeah, cool you had more cool. experience. Oh, yeah, we had uh, lots of different experiences there. Well, Debbie, I hate to, like, rush off. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. This girl's going to have her supper. And happy Halloween, everybody, and thank you so much for the honor of being a part of your show tonight. Well, I, I have to I definitely get you on for a full what hour. You're doing. <laughs> That's okay. Well, definitely we need to have you on for a whole hour sometime that, after you're not so That would be fantastic. Be. All right. I would love to talk with you guys. Well, good Sorry. luck on that part that you're waiting on. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to go turn the radio on so I can hear everybody else tonight. Awesome. <laughs> Take All care, right. Debbie. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So coming on next with us is um, Bishop James Long. He's the Archbishop of the United States of Old Catholic Church. He is a demonologist. Exorcist. He's been seen on shows such as Ghost Stories, A Haunting. Um, he's done paranormal paparazzi documentaries from the Sci Fi channels such as A Haunted Boy, The Possessed, and Spooked. So, welcome, Bishop James, to our show. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, we're glad you were able to join us. We've yeah. actually never had the pleasure of meeting you person to person, so we'll definitely have to look forward to that sometime. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> seems like you're a pretty busy man, so uh, thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to join yes, us. Yes, thank you. Well, absolutely, yeah, and thanks for thanks for inviting me. I know you guys have a lot of people um, waiting in the wings, so, but uh, yeah, thanks for the invite. <laughs> now, tell us your scariest ghost story that has happened to you. <laughs> well... <laughs> I love the last. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've I, got there's so many from Waverly Hills to cemeteries to, I think probably one of the most um, one of the most interesting ones for me was probably in in Bachelors Grove uh, in cemetery. Um, that's in uh, Cook County, Illinois, and because um, I went to graduate school in Motherline, and I, I, I visited there, and uh, that was um, uh, it's a very peculiar place. And when you're when you're there and you're walking, especially through the path, and there's weeds all around and, and bushes, um, you just I don't know, it's just a very strange thing. I was there quite late one evening, and there's no doubt in my mind that I saw uh, shadows, a hearing, you hear whispers. Uh, it's probably one of the most active places I've ever been to, as far as hauntings and things of this nature. So I would just say Batches Grove is probably way up there. Now. Can you describe like some experience that happened there, or or like a almost like a story, of you know? Uh, what what made it the most scariest in your mind? Yeah. As far as the most, you know, most scariest, I wouldn't say that would be the most scariest. I'd say that it was scary because you know I was there. It was it was starting to get late at night, uh, and you, it's very easy. You know, you can lose your lose your path because uh, there was a lot of, where I was. There was a lot of growth, and I tell you, 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 when you hear the noises, you hear the strange noises, and you think it's animals, and, and you, you know, one time it sounded like a, an animal, quite honestly, being attacked. And it's a horrific screeching noise. I mean, the, the sound was terrible. And I, I, I just kind of chucked it up, so it has to be an animal being attacked. And, but you hear it like three or four times. 
They're like, okay, this might be time for a <laughs> time for an, for a, an exit right now. Um, but it, it's shadows. Oh my God, the shadows you you would see um, all around. I mean, it was almost. I would say probably that that was the scary moment as far as. I was afraid that, oh, God, you know, get lost or, or twist and turn. Because it's not a huge cemetery. But, you know, you, it's, it's, um, it's one that you can kind of get disoriented. But probably the, the scariest place was the family had asked me to visit a cemetery because in, in uh, E-Town, Kentucky. Because uh, apparently a lot of people are going in there and doing some bad stuff, you know, some black magic, something to in. Just some, some really stupid stuff. And so I went in with uh, about four people. And it was very late at night, very, very late. And this, now imagine when you're going down this road, there are no lights, no street lights. It's a dirt road, and it goes on for a couple of miles. And there are, I mean, all, all it is is like woods on both sides, very, very dark. As a matter of fact, if you turn your lights off, you would not see anything, not, you, nothing. You couldn't even see the hand in front of your face. It was so dark. And a friend of mine had went there, in front of me, like four cars ahead of me, and uh, we, we, he stopped and he turned around. And I said, well, why are you turning around? He said, I'm not going in there. I said, well, what, what do you mean? We've got to go in there. The family asked us, I'm not going in there. And the reason being is because this guy is a very logical per- person. He said he was driving and he saw a little girl pushing a boy in an old wheelchair. And this is late at night. Now, keep in mind, there's nothing on the right or left except for woods, barbed wire. And so the... the he asked, he said, excuse me, I'm, we're trying to find the cemetery. Can you help us out? And the little girl just pointed straight down. And he thanked him, and he went a little further, and he looked back in the rearview mirror. They were not there. There's no way they could have gone left or right. There's no way. So he turned around, and he said, I'm not going. Um, there's no way I can do it. I can't do it. So he left, proceeded on, and we kept on driving. And this place, it's so heavy and so dark that when you go there, you feel the oppression uh, well before you actually dead end, because it dead ends into it. And so we went, we went back there, and it was completely calm, no clouds. We went in the back uh, to a tree. It's a tree where apparently a lot of satanic rituals are performed, uh, blessing the tree, etc., blessing the grounds. And the wind just started picking up, almost as if there was like a storm. I mean, it was just, it was so strange. The top of the trees were bending and bowing. And this was, again, like very late, and we would see shadows of, it looked like people were running around us, and, and it would have been impossible because there were cliffs. I mean, literally just running really fast, just all around us. And we then thought, okay, now, now we've got to be prepared for something else, and the other people were not who were with me, so we decided to leave. And while we were leaving, you could feel, there's one way in, one way out, the same path. You could feel almost that the cemetery was closing in around you. And there was no question. And, and everyone felt this. Everyone felt this. Finally, we got out, and I had a person there who doesn't believe in the paranormal at all. He, did, he thinks it's just a bunch of bunk. And um, he's very skeptical, but he took his camp, his light, his flashlight. We left the cemetery. We looked around, and he turned around and shot his flashlight on this tree. Now, at that time, there's a lot of leaves that are falling from the tree, so that you can still see the moonlight penetrating the tree. And he shined his light on this massive object that every single one of us saw. Wow. It was this huge, I don't know, it looked eight foot, seven foot, eight foot, massive winged, that's the best way to describe it, a winged creature. I don't know what it was. It, we saw it. It was very clear. He dropped his flashlight, screamed. <laughs> he got in the car. The other person in front of us um, was an executive. And he also didn't believe in the paranormal. So he got in his car. He went 80 miles per hour down this road, completely, completely destroyed his suspension in his $200,000 car. Destroyed it. Uh, he was absolutely terrified. Now, Bishop, do you think that to be uh, demonic? Well, it's something very evil. There's no question it was evil. I mean, the absolutely. I mean, the, the overwhelming oppression. I mean, and it, it, was, it was like on this tree, and it was looking down. It was very clear. Very, to this day, I would take a lie detector test. It was, it was a very strange um, creature, quite honestly. I've never seen it in my life before. I've never seen it. And people, I, you know, I've talked to people about this, and they say, well, you see the Mothman. I don't know what the Mothman is. I, I, I don't even know if I believe in the Mothman. But... Well, I know what I saw, and I know that these other people saw it, 
and it scared this executive so much that he destroyed his car to get out of that place. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I've heard of the Mothman, too. Wow. Not but, sure what I think about that, but... Wow, Bishop James, that was an awesome story. I yeah. love that. That was yeah. good. I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> that was really good. Um, I don't mean to cut it like short, um, but we are, we're thrilled that you were able to come on and tell us your um, story. That was awesome. We definitely want to have you on our show again sometime. For just a full hour or whatever. Yep. yep. So we can uh, have a much longer time to share with you, if that's okay with you. Um, Absolutely, having me on awesome well, well we'll get together and we'll schedule that um once again thank you so much for being on have our a happy show. halloween yeah happy halloween. Oh, you too have a great night thank you bye-bye oh that, that was, was the a, awesome one that was a good story i got this goosebumps was, on James that one it's awesome he really, i've seen him on on shows and stuff and these really next cool. three guests so yeah you don't actually, need introduction <laughs> well of course they need <laughs> Our next three guests is um, Ken, uh, Ken, sorry, Ken, Ken DaCosta. He's the founder and investigator of Rise Up Paranormal and investigator for the TAPS Home Team. Julie DeMay, she is an investigator, researcher, and video specialist for Rise Up Paranormal. And Joe Chin, an investigator for Rise Up Paranormal and the TAPS Team, and also best known um, from Ghost Hunters International. Welcome, all three of you. How are you? Good evening. You guys there? Hello? Oh. They were there. I think we just lost someone. <laughs> Hello? All right. So as she's trying to get that, I would just definitely like to thank everybody for being in the chat room tonight. Um, we definitely have some interesting people in there, and uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, what's that? Ken's in the chat room. Ken's in the chat room. Ken's in the chat room. <laughs> He's supposed to be on the air. Hello. Hi, Ken. Hey. Hi, how are you? I just had 45 seconds of something buzzing over the phone in my ear here. I didn't think, I, I, I thought you guys were under attack or something like that. <laughs> that was just me. I like to buzz like that. <laughs> Good Lord, that was, that was, un, it was unreal. But anyway, that, it went away. How are you, Ty? Good, how are you? Good, you? Uh, very good, thanks. Very good, thanks. Very yeah. Trying to keep control of the uh, controlled chaos. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, very festive mood tonight. It is the season. Yeah, okay. definitely. So, Ken, tell us your scariest ghost story that has happened to you. Oh, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to tell you a real ghost story. Yeah, that's I'm going what to I tell want. You a, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to tell you a documented ghost story. Okay, and uh, my ghost story began, this sounds like a bio channel. Um, my, my, the ghost story began in a restaurant down my end of the state here in Rhode Island that when we first started the group, we were asked to come in. And it was built on land owned by a woman named Rebecca Cornell. Now, as the story goes, Rebecca was an elderly lady. She was around 73 years old when all this took place. And she lived with a ne'er-do-well son, uh, translation, he was a bum named Thomas, <laughs> and his wife, Sarah, and a couple of kids. So Thomas and Sarah were basically sponging off Rebecca at the time, and the poor woman was mistreated horribly. Uh, at her advanced age, she would have to go outside in the winter and cut her own firewood if she was cold. She barely had enough blankets to keep her warm in the winter months. And eventually she got tired of uh, this treatment and started to tell people in the family that she was thinking about getting out from underneath all this. So word got back to Thomas that his meal ticket may be leaving town because he had designs to inherit the property and basically continued to sponge off of his mother even after her death. So one Sunday afternoon, 
Uh, she didn't like the salt mackerel dinner that was prepared, so she oh, excused herself and went up to her. Oh, yeah, well, I don't blame her. But uh, she went back up to her room <clears throat> to knit, and Rebecca smoked a corn cob pipe. She sat in front of the fireplace inside of her room. When they hadn't heard from her for a few hours, they sent one of the grandchildren up there. He knocked at the door, and there was no answer. So eventually he got his father, and her son Thomas went up, pushed the door open, and found Rebecca half in the fireplace burned. Oh my. So immediately he called the constables, reported this, and it was basically written off as an old lady who stumbled, lost her balance, fallen into the fire, a tragic accident. And nothing more was said about this. Thomas, of course, went on to live there. He would inherit everything. Now, Rebecca had a brother, John Briggs. And one night, John was in bed, and he was awoken by a glow inside the room. When he opened his eyes and looked at the foot of the bed, he saw something engulfed in flames. And as he looked at it, with this horrified look on his face, he said, what are you? And the words came from this being said, gaze upon me, Briggs. I am your sister. See how I have been wronged. See how I burn. I have been murdered. Well, obviously, John didn't get a wink of sleep for the rest of the night, but just prayed yeah. on his mind. So he contacted the constables and said that he would like the body of his sister exhumed. This was just a matter of a few days later because he felt that there was foul play involved. Well, he convinced the constables to do this. They got their court order. They exhumed the body. And when they did a proper autopsy, they found a puncture wound in her stomach. Mm. Well, because there had been already some kind of turbulence and hostilities in the house and Thomas certainly had motive he certainly had means to a weapon he was tried at the trial his wife Sarah made the remark that well she always did like a good fire anyway she was very flippant about the whole thing which didn't win many points and she also, in an act of desperation, tried to convince everyone that Rebecca was a witch. Well, that failed miserably as well. Thomas was tried and convicted of the murder of his mother. He was marched up to Monotonity Hill in Newport, Rhode Island, where he was hanged until he was dead. It remains to this day the only case in United States jurisdictional history where a man has been sentenced to death based on the testimony of a ghost. Wow. wow. And, that's, and that is a documented ghost story. That's now, a good one. There's, also an, there's also an addendum to this, too, I'd like to throw in for your consideration. Do any of you think that matricide or patricide can be genetic? In other words, do you think a killer can give birth to a killer, can give birth to another killer? That's an interesting question. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I would almost, you, think that, would almost think that you could have a hereditary gene, yeah, that's what I was thinking, a gene. to trigger some type of mental <laughs> illness. Chemical illness. Right. Yeah. Well, you might be right because our story, now normally it's an interesting story. And it's documented here in the state of Rhode Island. So it is a true ghost story. But if it ended there, it would be strange enough, but it doesn't end there. At the time of the trial, Sarah was pregnant with a little girl. Oh, wow. And in an, act, in an act of defiance, she named the little girl Innocence. Innocence Cornell. Wow. I've heard of this girl. And Innocence went on to grow into a young woman and married, and had children of, the, of, of her own, and they had children, and they had children, and so forth and so on. One member of her descendants, a great, great, great grandchild, is probably someone that you've heard of, 
or maybe not. Have you ever heard of a woman named Elizabeth Gordon? Ah. Yes, Lizzie Gordon. Oh, yeah, sure. Yep. Now we see. Which was innocent, great, great, yeah, great, great, great grandchild. Wow. So the the tie-in is when we went to investigate this restaurant on the property um, and began to research it. Um, I learned and found out about one of my favorite ghost stories. It may not be a personal experience, but I thought in spirit of the of the season, that was something I wanted to share with you. That's awesome. That's a good one. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Wow. I hear Great. Joe. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hey, Hi, Joe. Joe. How are How's you? your story? Good. My story now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, there were actually two in particular. Um, there was one incident where um, I, I was working at a country club here in Lincoln, Rhode Island, and I was on my way to pick up um, a paycheck. And I was driving with my sister, who I was living with at the time, my sister Bonnie. And uh, we had just picked up, picked up our paychecks, and we were going to deliver another paycheck to a friend down the road. So we proceed to drive on the street down the road. It's Windy Road in, in Lincoln, and it's about dusk time. And uh, we noticed that there was some debris in the road, and uh, it, I couldn't tell what it was. But when we ran over it, it felt like rocks. Um, and we're, I could feel the car shake, and I could feel the bumps, and, and we're driving, we think it's really strange. And then split second later, we see this, what looks like a man in a black and red checkered shirt or jacket, and then he had a uh, same color cap, um, but he had a leaf blower, and he was looked like he was blowing leaves across the road as he was just waving the wand around. But this happened right as we were coming around a corner, and we didn't even see where he came from. It looked like he came out of the tire of the driver's side front tire and kept walking. So we were like, well, that's really odd. So we dropped the paycheck, and on the way back, we hit the same road. And when we went to uh, go to that spot where we experienced uh, the debris in the road and, and the gentleman we saw, um, there was nothing there. But I could physically okay. feel the rocks as we drove over it. And when we went back, it was clear there was nothing on the roads. How so weird. Actually physically oh. moved the car. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was an odd I was like, what was that? Because it's in the daytime, kind of dusk. I could still see a little bit of light. And we were looking for the rocks. We should be careful that the rocks above, you know, don't, don't uh, drive into them and get into an accident. So we uh, approached the area carefully, and there were no rocks. There was nothing that really was clear. Well, it weird. was strange. Yeah. yeah. That's very, very odd. And did you have another one that you... Did you yeah, see there was one other incident where I was uh, away filming for GHI, and uh, we were in Denmark, and it was at a castle called Castle Dragslom. And uh, there was one investigation um, time where Brandy and myself went down to the basement where supposedly Mary Queen of Scots' husband was in prison and had died there. Um, so we were investigating for an hour, and there's just the three of us, myself, Brandy, and one cameraman. And it was a pretty small dungeon, dirt floor, um, rocks around for walls, uh, nothing to lean on. And we were down there for an hour investigating, trying to get an EVP session done. Um, but nothing happens. Uh, so we were like, well, it's been an hour, and nothing's really happening. Let's go upstairs and find a different part of the castle. So we do. But as we go up the stairs, my arms starts to burn and sting, as though I'm getting like a cigarette burn or something just really burning on my, on my wrist here. So she says, we'll wait to get to the top of the stairs. I'll look at it. So when I got to the top of the stairs, I pulled my sweatshirt up and my long sleeve shirt, and then underneath I had teeth marks, what looked like human teeth marks. There were four wow. teeth, a spade, and another tooth, just the tops, not the bottoms. And you could feel the, the indent of the tooth as I ran my fingers over it. Over my wow. Skin. So they were all excited, and they took photos, and they were like, all right, we've got a film part of this, but we need you to go back downstairs. And I said, no way. <laughs> like, <"Well>, for you. <laughs> that thing bit me. <laughs> I'm not going down there again. But I had to. So it took like 40 minutes for me to, like, shake the feeling off that I got bitten by something I couldn't see. Um, wow. But we went back down, and luckily nothing happened, but that was a really odd occurrence. Now, how long did you have those marks on you? It lasted about 40 minutes. Wow. Wow, I think that was shaking me up a little, too. It was yeah, crazy. Like, what hit me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow, that's 
free. Do you ever get that feeling there again? Does it come as you know, like a no? Like a, uh, so it, it felt kind of strange in Thoughts of the Castle. Thoughts of the Castle, I felt like something didn't want us there. Um, but as you know, being a paranormal investigator, we usually look by feelings. We try to get you know documents that something is around and check them, the environment. Um, so I usually don't expect it, but we were hearing disembodied voices during camera setup. And it, was, it was pretty like it's going to be an active night out. <laughs> yeah, right. Huh? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um. That's awesome. <laughs> I, love, I mean, I, it's funny because, like, people will tell us, you know, scary things that happen to them, and I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And then it's like, oh, wait, no. <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> i got to remember to, like, pull that back. <laughs> Joe, just real it's quick. It's a little scary sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely. We uh, we actually had a, a, a question for you, Joe, on that first um the first uh, story that you told us, and um, this is so off our chat off room. our chat room. Yeah, we have a, a gentleman okay. named Eric Hardy um, that's actually asking or wondering if you know if a man has been hit in that area previously on that roadway. That I don't know because I only had the job for like maybe four months. So I was kind of new and new to the area. I, I never worked in the country club before, and it was all kind of a whole new experience. But uh, I didn't do any research, which I probably should have, to see if somebody had died um, mm -hmm. in that particular road at some point. It would be interesting to see if that actually yeah. you know, was the case. That'd be, definitely. It would add, definitely add to the story, too, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. Now, uh, thank Julie, you for that question. Oh, you're welcome. Well, no, thank you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Eric. We take, take credit for it. Yeah, wasn't I? It's a good question, though. Definitely a good question. Now, Julie, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Julie. How are Hello, you doing? Julie. Good. How are you doing? Hi, Julie. I'm uh, busy day, but um, I'm looking forward to telling my story. Awesome. Okay, everybody else. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi. Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi. All right, go ahead. Tell us your story. Do you need, do you need spooky music in the background? Yes. If you want, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> this, um, now you have to see what I have to put up with every day with Ken. We love it. We love it. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. This happened, um, this happened several years ago before I was to rise up. I won some kind of contest for a charity event at some house in Taunton to investigate it with a group. And I was with uh, several friends, and we were, you know, in the house, and it was the anniversary of a murder that had taken place 250 years ago. Wow. So they thought that was a real good reason to investigate, and I think a slave had been murdered in, in the kitchen, and I think her body was found in the basement. So I thought that was that was pretty interesting. Yeah. So we, we had we had gone there and we started off I we were in the attic or something and during the course of the evening there were several times you could hear a door slam. And they had the walkies and nobody claimed you know, it was them and I'm like, Yeah, right, you know, let's you know get the crap out of the public here. You know? Right. So I'm like, fine and so at one point we were at a break and we were actually in we, I think we were in the kitchen, and there was dim lighting, so I could actually look out of the kitchen where they had their command central set up, and there was there was some lighting. And I noticed there was a door pried open. Now, keep in mind, they didn't have carpets, you know, 250 years ago. Right. So this door was wedged open in the hallway, and I was thinking to myself, this is an opportunity. If somebody wants to get my attention, I'm looking at a door. Go for it. So I'm I'm looking at the door. There's nobody recording. I didn't have a camcorder at the time. No audio. Nothing was recording. And I'm staring at the door. And at first, I'm I'm, I'm sort of asking questions silently. I'm like, if you're here, this is your chance. Go for it. And I thought I saw the door wiggle a little bit. I'm like, yeah, my eyes are just playing tricks on me. It's two in the morning. Mm -hmm. And it, then it slammed right in my face. Scared the living crap out of me. <laughs> wow. Five feet away. Wow. Five feet away. And the thing is, while it slammed, it wasn't like a real fast 
as it was closing, I mumbled very loudly because as it scared the crap out of me, I was trying to get other people's attention in the room, and all came out was just mumbles. And for like five, it scared the living crap out of me, and then it just closed. And I'm like, oh, my God. And that is literally, I mean, I have never been so scared where I was like, I'm trying to get everybody's attention. Please look at the door. It's closing on me. And, and nobody saw it. They saw it when it closed. Wow. Wow. Wow, that would probably make me scream. Right. I get locked in the closet. I'm banging that door until somebody opens it. I think it's, I didn't want to leave the room. You know, I'm like, oh, right. my God, is the door going to slam on me again? And what right. we did, we had turned the lights on, and I checked out the door. It had been wedged way under the carpet. So I think whoever was moving it had to give it a little nudge to actually break it loose from the carpet. And that's wow. what I did see. And then it closed on me. Wow. And I mean, I've per- done my I've done so many investigations and this by far was the scariest. You would walk into rooms and you thought you were walking into air conditioned rooms. Wow. Wow. It was mm. unbelievable. Burst of like cold air, everything. So this was by far um the scariest thing that probably I you know, I mean, I guess you know, if you ask yourself, you know, really be careful what you wish for. Yeah. I yeah. wish for the door to close it. and it did. <laughs> wow. It heard your thoughts, huh? <laughs> it's, 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 that's that's what I was sort of thinking, you know. I've I've never asked questions that way, just in my mind and mm-hmm. they actually responded. So that was that was actually very interesting. I actually get that quite a bit. Like I'll actually be thinking a question and I'll get the response, either a K2 or a light to come on or what have you. Before it comes it's, it's actually, it's baffling. I, I almost want to try to see if I can research that a little bit more on if they actually can read your thoughts instead of just actually hearing the questions. Right. Absolutely. Well, well guys, who's to, who's to say if they're actually reading your thoughts all along and they're not listening right. to you? That would yeah. make sense. That, that definitely is a good question. Well, you guys, thank you so much for coming on our show and sharing your ghost story. We definitely love having you guys on. So. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, definitely love having you, you guys on. Thank you for having us. Thank you so oh, much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All three of you have a happy Halloween. Yeah. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Okay, same thank to you, too. and uh, have a great show. All right. Thank, thank you. Guys. See you guys. You're welcome. Okay, bye. 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 All right, that was Ken DaCosta, Joe Chin. And Julie DeMay, um, you guys want to give a little update of the World Series? Uh, since it's on a commercial, I have no idea. I think it's one nothing one Boston. Nothing. One nothing Boston. Top going to the top of the. Oh yeah. The third, right? I think you should get this guy on though, since he's been waiting yeah. twelve minutes, almost thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Bob. Hello. Hi Bob. How are you? Hey Naomi, hey Steve, how are you? <laughs> Good, I am doing you? excellent, especially with my new paranormal haircut. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I just got that. <laughs> you know what? It was so funny because I didn't even recognize you guys at that event, okay? And I just saw so many people that weekend. You know how you put the blinders on and you're just kind of like, you're going through the motions, you want to make everybody happy? And yeah. I, I kind of grabbed you two out of the crowd. I said, come on, you're coming with me. Come to the barbershop. Yeah. Well, you, you actually did us a favor because we wanted to get away from the group. So yeah. I needed to oh, get good, into, a, good. into a spot where I could actually good. do my own thing. Yeah, you know, as, as paranormal investigators, you want to go off, do your own thing. You have your own procedures, your own guidelines, and, you know, you want to get away from the contamination and just do what, you know, you do, which is investigating. And, um, you know, very and thrilled you picked us. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we were thrilled and glad that we did that uh, haircut thing and heard the shears on the EVP. And yeah, just to let the awesome. listeners know a little bit. Yeah, I thought it was the uh, the trigger object in a barber chair. And people that know me know I don't have my yeah. hair anyways. But uh, so you sat in the chair. I sat in the chair <laughs> and we asked the barber to give me a haircut. And on the live playback of the EVP that I was listening to, I could actually hear the shears 
of metal scissors. And at the same time, I felt what felt like cobwebs going across my face. Which like hair. Wow. Almost like hair. Face. Wow. Um, and we actually did get catch the, the shears on voice recording. So. Yeah. yeah. And wow. those, cool. those, <laughs> we did. those who, uh, those of our listeners who um, like to know who Bob Christopher is, is a lead investigator, tech manager, and co-founder of NEPA Paranormal and Ghost Detective TV and radio show as heard on our very own BTM Wicked Radio. Radio. <laughs> Out of the family. Yeah, Bob's family. <laughs> All right, Bob, tell us, tell us your, your ghost story. Well, I, I've done so many investigations, and I thought about which exactly one I could tell, and there was just so many, but... I'm actually going to tell you a story that actually got me into the paranormal field. Uh, I grew up in a house that was, I would definitely deem as a haunted house. Um, you know, back in the day when I was younger, you couldn't really talk to your neighbor or you couldn't go out and tell somebody that you had a haunted house. You know, they would look at you like you, you were belonged in a rubber room. You know, it was very taboo and uh, you didn't talk to your priest or nothing about stuff like this, but we had stuff happen on a daily basis. I mean, from the time I was nine years old till the time I was 16 years old, we owned this house. And what happened was we had remodeled the attic. And you, you know, I, I never had no idea about, you know, how re- remodeling could, uh, you know, spawn paranormal activity. So after we finished this, we would, well, I wouldn't. I never actually saw it. My mom, my dad... My sister and my brother, they would see this thing on a daily basis. They would walk through the walls. They would walk the stairs. It would sound like chains dragging in the middle of the night, um, door slamming. I mean, the whole gauntlet that you can imagine. Items moving constantly. And already I got so used to it that I would just kind of, you know, whatever. I just kind of walk right by things. But the one scariest thing that ever happened to me, and this is what I think got me into the paranormal field, one night I had my bed actually levitate. Wow. And it felt like I was tied, tied down to the bed. And I couldn't talk. I couldn't scream. I couldn't do anything. It was like it had me prisoner. You know what I mean? And I could feel the bed floating, and it's like the, the legs are going back and forth, tipping back and forth. So finally, after all of this, going on. I don't know how long it lasted. It, it probably wasn't that long, but it felt like eternity, you know. You know, I screamed for my mother, of course. You know, I was only probably 10 years old at the time, and she came in. She said, you know, she still tells the story to this day. She says, you were as white as a sheet, you know, and I told her the story, and she says, Go on. you know, of course, she's trying to come for me, saying it's my imagination, you know what I mean? But we all knew what was going on. So the day after that, we actually went over and discussed this with, with our, our priest, and he came and did a house blessing. So at the time, we had, I think it was seven or eight doors in the house, and he put blessed crucifixes over each door in the house to help, you know, ward this off. So about three days after these crucifixes were, were hung up, I said to my mom, I says, why did you take all the crucifixes down? And she says, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the crucifixes are gone. These crucifixes disappeared. Every one of them. There were seven of them. I remember seven. And, uh, you know, we just kind of put it off. You know, again, you, you try to ignore it. About, I would say it was like six years later, we were coming in with a grocery order. Myself, my mother, my father. And, we, you know, there's a living room, a parlor, and then you go into the kitchen. We're walking through into the parlor, and on this big living room table, there's the seven crosses lined up. Wow. wow. Really? So that was, that was pretty wild, I mean, you know, for that to happen like that. And after that, I, I think two years after that, I got married, and, um, you know, we had my daughter. Like five years after that, we decided we were going to start this paranormal group and you know I always wanted to investigate the house you know because I always told the stories to my you know my friends and whoever was in our group about it 
So my mother would never <laughs> let us in there. I mean, never. She didn't want nothing to do with that. She didn't want, you know what I mean? The activity had died down. She doesn't want anything going on anymore. She didn't want you to so stir it up. Decided, no, not at all. So my father had passed, and she decided she was going to move into a, a, a high-rise, you know, a smaller house. She couldn't take care of it anymore. And she sold the house. And the night before it was, you know, she, it was going to be turned over, she came to me, and she gave me the keys, and she said, you have 15 hours do what you want to do. So we actually got to investigate it. And um, we did a 15-hour investigation, and we got nothing except one EVP. And the EVP was meant for me, and it said, you lived here. And wow. I said, that was plenty enough for me. <laughs> yeah. And that's my story. <laughs> that's yeah. so cool. That's cool. So did mean... you ever end up putting the crosses back up? And what you did uh, yes, we did. Actually, we did. And there's, there's a little bit more to it. They, they sold it to, like, a Mexican family in the area. And I thought, I tried to buy the house about six months later. I drove by the house, and there is this six-foot crucifix on the front of the house. And I'm thinking, okay, I think they met him. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you want to go knock on the door. Yeah, so, yeah, I didn't want to even push the issue. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm actually glad I'm out of that house. I, I don't want nothing to do with it anymore because I, I know exactly what I went through. Now, but was that's there actually what got me into the paranormal field. Now, was there any other things that happened in the house besides uh, what you told us about? Oh, sure. I mean, like I said, it, it was the gauntlet. It was door slamming, you know, classic chains rattling. Um, there was a wheelchair we had upstairs. We would close it, and that, you know, uh, a week later, it would be at the top of the stairs wide open, just, you know, with the door open, looking down the stairs at us. And we're like, oh, man, some of this stuff is just outrageous, you know. Tools wow. tools missing all the time. But, of course, my dad would blame me for taking tools, not the ghost, you know. <laughs> so if that freaked you out so bad, uh, why did you continue? Uh, you know, going into the... Well, the thing was, the thing was, back then, like I said, you just couldn't go to anybody and ask for help. You know what I mean? There wasn't groups like there is now where anybody can just go online and say, okay, I need a paranormal group, da 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 da, da you know, and you find five in your area. There was, like, nobody. I mean, maybe the Warrens were out there with that. You know, that's yeah. how long ago it was. So, you know, we decided that we were going to, you know, start helping people with, you know, the NEP paranormal side of it. And uh, we we did that for about seven years. And then uh, we landed the TV show, of course. We're more into that for about four years now. But we've never actually mixed the two. We've always kept them separate. And even in the, on the TV show, if you watch any of our episodes, we've done 55 episodes of date, and we've never done a house. We always keep the, that part of it away from the TV show. Now, what does uh, NEPA actually stand for? Northeastern Pennsylvania. Told ya. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because we have like a group here that goes by NEPA. Oh, and friends of ours. Northeast Paranormal Association. <clears throat> of New Hampshire. Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, let's call, call I know. I, I made an appearance on, um, what is it, Ghost Adventures, and uh, that's what they call it, NEPA. Oh, so technically you guys don't go by NEPA. No. no. You just go N-E-P-A. by NEPA. Okay. Gotcha. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. Now you have um, your daughter and your wife on your team as well, right? Yes. Yes, I do. Now, um, my da- actually, my daughter, my daughter is a co-founder, and my wife just comes along to see me anymore because. She doesn't get to see me at all. <laughs> That's how you she know got how involved busy with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's kind of cool. I mean, that you you guys are co-founders together of it. You know, I mean, keeping it in the family. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah, my daughter actually yeah. comes yeah. on with us every now and then. Yeah. But uh, right now she's still in high school and has a full-time job, so. She isn't part of the group, but she likes to come along with us. So. Oh yeah, and it's amazing. I mean, how how well she does, and she's 
very professional and um, does a great job, you know. Yeah. And, you know, doesn't fool around or any of that stuff. You ever feel protected to go over? I know I do. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, we have a good mix of our group. We have an older crowd and we have a younger crowd. So we, we pretty much have everything covered, like, as far as, you know what I mean, like age groups. Um, when we deal with children, we'll send the younger people in, you know, obviously. Or that if it's of that, their era, we believe the spirit. You know, we'll send them in because they know how to talk better than I do. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm old school myself. <laughs> you know, it all comes around, right? You know, eventually, you know, awesome is awesome again and and uh, totally and, you know, all those words come up back eventually and you don't sound old school anymore. <laughs> so, Bobby, we, uh, we actually met you at uh, for the first time at uh, Rolling Hills and... Um, one of the things when we when we broke apart and do our own to do our own thing, uh, me and Naomi actually went down this hallway where I believe you and George Lopez and I want to say Jiggy yeah, were um, in a room doing a hack shack session. Um, and from what we heard out in the hallway, it seemed pretty amazing. Um, did I actually hear incredible. that thing? Did I actually hear that thing say your name three times? It's not only did it say my name three times, I was so freaked out by the thing. But George, <laughs> oh my God, he's a he's a pioneer as far as the ghost box. I mean, I don't know how you feel about the ghost box, but I would rather get a root canal than do the ghost box session. I just, it's so annoying to me. Yeah, it really that's how is. I feel. But uh, yeah. you know, hey, you know, you're trying to get yes or no answers, and you're gonna get that. You know what I mean with with the ghost box, but. The way he does it, he gets he does like validation words, and the words are so far out there. Like the one validation word was balloon star, and I said, "What the heck is he talking about?" And then all of a sudden, I hear, you know, the ghost box say four times balloon star. I'm like, "Am I hearing this right?" You know, you're like scratching your head there. You know what I mean? Right. But uh, yeah, he he is just incredible. Hey, it's it said, uh, he he actually thought that a dark spirit had entered the room because we were getting a lot of really deep voices at the time. Yeah. And uh, some spirit came on and said, now you know how the ghost box is. You get one word real quick. It yeah. said, he's a very violent person. Like the whole sentence. And I was like, oh my God. Wow. It, it just said, he's a very violent person. You know, and then George immediately says, well, I'm calling on St. Michael the Archangel for some help. And all of a sudden it says, Archangel. You know, we're like, oh my God! <laughs> wow. You know what's uh, very odd about that whole that whole session that you guys were doing too is, me and Naomi had actually walked past the room and I heard it say your name three times and and I was just like, I've never heard the the ghost box and that like accurate. So we stopped and when we turned around, we both actually saw this shadow walk at the end of the hallway. There's a big atrium area. And it walked from the right-hand side of that atrium area to the left-hand side. It was probably about six foot tall, about 250-pound bill, black shadow walked across the, the hallway. And I didn't say anything at first. Wow. And Naomi says, did you just see that? Um, and he goes, yeah, like, black shadow, here you go, come right yeah. to the left. And I'm wow. Like, yeah. And I, wow. I actually think it's pretty amazing how it happened at the same time you guys were getting those reactions. Um, I don't even know how right, to stop right. that hallway. But. <laughs> you should have come in. You, I mean, we were having a ball, and you would have been more than welcome to come in. We actually, it was it was me, George, and Jiggy, and um, after everybody left, it was like 3 a.m., you know, Sharon's like, are you guys leaving? I said, George, we're going to leave? And he says, no, I'm not leaving yet, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> we fired on up to the shadow hallway, you know, and there was like six of us up there, and George got in the wheelchair. And, you know, he's whispering to me while just, like, you know when those, those doors open all the time in the back? They're just supposed to open up. Yeah. In Shadow Hollow, like, right behind you, the doors open up. And you can hear knocking behind the doors. And everybody's looking at the doors. And George is going to me. He's whispering. He's going, don't look that way. Look this way. Down the hallway. Because it was trying to get your attention that way, but doing something else the opposite way. And he already knew this. So I can hear all these bangs, and, you know, you want to look that way because of all the banging and everything. Mm -hmm. But I took his advice, and I kept looking, and all of a sudden you see this crawler coming out of one of the rooms. And I'm like, 
holy shit, are you seeing this? And he's going, all of a sudden he gets out of the wheelchair and he's running down the hallway after it, right? And he's turning around to me and saying, are you behind me? And I'm like, 50 feet behind him. I'm going, yeah, I'm behind you. <laughs> Blow him. <laughs> Go ahead. Take care of it, he said. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. And then he gets down there. He goes, man, he says, I didn't realize I ran so fast. I said, yeah, you're fast, man. I couldn't keep up with you. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, Jeff, this has I actually can't wait till November 11th when you're on our show. So our listeners will have to listen in live for another full hour episode with Bob. Yep, and hopefully you awesome. can bring some of your teammates with you. Sure. I hope so. I hope, I hope a few of them join us. Can I give a shout out to them? Oh, yeah. absolutely. All right. I'd like to give a shout out to the entire Ghost Detective team Kathy, Kelly, Katie, and Kim. Dave, our new editor, who did a fantastic job this year. Thank you, Dave. Um, Andrew and Mark, thank you so much. Awesome. And definitely listen uh, to, their, um, to their radio show. What's that on Tuesday night, Bob? Tuesday night. Yeah. So, yeah. Check them out on the uh, DTM Wicked Radio family. Yep, and in Pennsylvania, they have their show, the uh, Ghost Detectives TV, which you just finished your season, fourth season? Fourth season. Yep, we're already booking for season five, so I'm looking forward to working with you guys. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. We'll be in touch, Bob. <laughs> it was awesome talking with you, and thank you so much for your ghost stories. And we'll talk to you on Monday, November right. 11th. Have a happy Halloween. Thanks, Bob. See you, Bob. Thanks for having me, guys, and have a happy Halloween, everybody. Bye. Same to you. All right, bye. All right, did you guys get the uh, update yet? Oh, now we're on a commercial. Still one nothing. Still one Still nothing. nothing. Yep. Wow. Boston. Oh, woohoo! Go Boston! All right, so our next guest is actually the one person who was my first actual interview that I went on with, and uh, she is so sweet, a ray of sunshine. She is the radio show host of Walk in the Darkness on GTN. Um, she's an investigator and founder of Chasing Shadows Paranormal. I'd like to welcome Sean Payne Stowe. What's going on, Sean? Hey, what's going on, guys? Hi. Did Hello. You just, did you just get out of work? Yes, I did. I'm actually on the road driving. <laughs> and see, you must be cheerful because you got out of work. I know I'm like that. <laughs> actually, I'm thinking about all the work that I got to do when I get home. <laughs> um, ah. I'm trying to stay positive. <laughs> there you go. How you guys? How you guys been? Good. We are doing good. excellent. Yeah. You know, busy yeah. Halloween season like anybody else, but we're getting through it. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah well, thank like you for inviting me on. I appreciate that. Oh, we're thrilled to have you. We definitely should have had you on sooner. Yeah. And we definitely yeah. have to have you on for a whole hour. Because uh, oh, Sean, yeah. Sean is awesome to talk with. We love talking to Sean. I, lo- I love your little documentaries Aww. when you're on the road to places. Oh, yes. Me <laughs> being... <laughs> You know, the, the funny thing about that is, is that I, like, I travel so much that it's like when I get on the road, it's, I don't have anything to do, and it's like half the time, you know, my everybody in my family doesn't, like, want to talk on the phone, so I'm just like, what am I going to do? So I just start making videos. <laughs> so, I feel I'm like I'm on the trip with you. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Naomi actually did that same thing when we went to Rolling Hills. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whole trip. yeah. Well, not the whole thing. It's like, oh, we probably should have videotaped that part. Yeah. Yeah. Terry and Brian are gonna yeah. be mad. At us. Hey. <laughs> hey, look, it's Thomas the Train on the back of a big rig. <laughs> oh my God. Crazy. <laughs> Anyways, all right, Sean, tell us your wonderful ghost story. Oh my goodness, I have. Oh, I have so many of them. Let me think. Um. I, let's see here. What would be? Oh, I remember uh, I investigated at uh, Eastern State Penitentiary, and I was oh. in cell block 
four. And I'm, it was like one of my first couple investigations that I'd ever done. My first one was at Rolling Hills. So um, I was terrified when I went there the first time. And uh, but then I, I felt comfortable after I got in there. But Eastern State was my second one. And, and like, um, I was with a couple other people. We were going in. We went to um, bring all of our equipment in, and it was so dark in there. And a couple guys met us at the gate and took us into the round rotunda. And we set up all of our equipment, and I'm, we're, we're kind of splitting off. Uh, going to do going to uh, different cell blocks, and I had actually one investigator with me, and I'm in I'm in the in the cell block four, like I said, and I'm <laughs> excuse me, I'm trying to um, rile up a little bit of activity, and uh, you know I'm like, hey, you know, there's a female in here, don't you want to talk to me, you know, and uh, there's like nothing, so I'm like, oh, it turns out to be investigator, I said, oh. They must be they must be kind of scared of me or something like that. So next thing you know, I'm I'm I keep talking, I keep talking, and I turn around, and the other investigator is gone, like left me all the way at the end of cell block four. I'm like, oh my god. So this is like my second like my second big investigation, and I'm like, okay, I'm down here by myself. I just went and riled everything up. All of a sudden, as I'm walking back up towards, because I'm like, yeah, I'm going to head more towards up where you come into the cell block. And uh, as I'm walking back up, all I'm hearing is, is cell doors just slamming on the upper top part. And I'm like, yeah, it's time for me to get the hell up out of here. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm walking like real fast. And then I happen to, when I was going through, when I'm heading back up, my camera it kind of caught me off guard so much with having those doors slam like that that I wasn't focusing on where my camera was pointing. So my camera's like pointing in every single cell block, every single cell as I'm going by. And I actually caught a black shadow figure on my, um, that was moving inside the cell as I was going by. So it was, it was really freaking creepy being in there by yourself. And, uh, I also got felt up when I was in there, which is, is always just fantastic. <laughs> no, but, uh, something was feeling up my leg when I was sitting in one of the, uh, one of the cells and I uh, kind of, kind of freaked me out. Yeah. I was like, yeah. And then, uh, we were doing like, um, um, spirit box session and it was talking about how he was a, he was a rapist and, all this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I'm getting felt up by a rapist now, you know. Oh. So that was kind of that was kind of freaky, but um, yeah, definitely Eastern State is like is very very nuts in there. Um, I've done a couple really crazy. I kind of now steer away a lot from residentials because I had some really bad experiences with them. So um, one particular residential that I did which I'm actually still working with a homeowner now because um, the property, we ended up having to do a cleansing of the property because it was, the accuracy level was so bad. So we ended up doing a cleansing, and it's been kind of quiet there for about a year. But now things are kind of getting revved up again because it was the anniversary of a Native American slaughter that happened on her property. So she's been having a lot of um, activity going on again. And some really crazy stuff. So I've been working with her continuously. But one particular time I remember being there, um, I was standing outside and, um, you know, like up there with a residential, of course, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do any type of provoking. I don't want to leave that homeowner with anything, you know, to right. after the fact. So I'm just standing up there, you know, just asking basic questions like, you know, um, can you tell us your name? Can you tell us when you died? Different things like that. And um, all of a sudden, rocks start zinging by my head. And they're, like, hitting wow. the actual house. And, I mean, like, I fell to the ground. Like, I'm, I'm sitting here, like, holding my head, trying to avoid these rocks from hitting me in the head. But whatever it was, was throwing rocks at me because we uh, – I went and accounted for the all of the family um, – Everybody that was on the property that day, did, you know, was looking around in the in the 
like bushes and stuff. Make sure nobody's hiding in there playing jokes on me. But, right. But yeah, there was nobody. But yeah, I, you know, like I found that she's been the only residential that I've kind of really. Um, the other ones that I've done, the activity has kind of um, subsided enough to where the homeowner feels comfortable. But I've had a couple where. <laughs> actually, one in particular where um, the lady actually lied about a lot of stuff, and they, she was doing, um, she had caused a lot of the activity in her house by doing some negative stuff, and mm-hmm. I ended up getting, um, having some side effects from it afterwards. I had something that had followed me home, mm-hmm. and uh, so I ended up in the hospital twice after that with um, severe uh, pain in my chest. I woke up with bruises on me. Um, wow. Stuff like that. I mean, yeah, it was it was crazy. So it's like I kind of I kind of especially me being a solo investigator right now. I don't I don't do anything like that alone. You know because you never know. I mean you you can go into residentials and people might be a nutcase or something kill you or something. You know. So right. Yeah. Me being by myself and being a female, I, of course I got to take all precautions. So. I don't really do anything unless I can. I have somebody else with me. But, um, yeah, I've just, like, so many crazy things have happened to me. Um, you know, from, I, I swear I'm probably, like, the touch magnet. I get touched constantly wherever I go. Usually they, they come up and they'll, they like to grab anywhere and everywhere that they can touch. So it's like, um, yeah, I, I don't really particularly like that. But, um, you know, I guess, you know, it's something that you got to deal with, so. Right. We have an investigator. He likes to touch everybody in our group, too, but. What? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's crazy. Like, um, recently, just here recently, I think one of the most scariest things that has ever happened to me is you always hear about attachments and things like that. Um, I always used to think to myself, whatever, attachments are, I don't believe in all that. Well, here recently, um, I started noticing some weird stuff like um, my personality and things was changing, and I was, like, um, having a lot of issues as far as, like, my mood going up and down. One minute I wanted to, like, freaking kill somebody and rip somebody's head off. The next minute I'm, like, freaking so upset and and, like, manic and all this stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm 38 years old now, so maybe I better go to the doctor and find out, make sure I'm not, like, you know, pre-menopausal or some crap. So I go there, everything's fine. Everything's fine. So, <clears throat> oh, I got this cold and it won't go away. But, um, so uh, it um, more or less what was going on is that I had developed a slight attachment from somewhere, and um, what it was doing was kind of messing with a lot of my moods, and I had to actually seek the help of some people, um, a couple of people to help me um, to try to get rid of it, and um, yeah, I, I never thought that I could ever, that anything like that would ever happen, but it, it is crazy when you have an attachment, because I did not feel like myself, I didn't feel like anything that I was doing was, you know, like, you know, everything that, things things I was posting on Facebook, like, was absolutely crazy, like, absolutely crazy, and I go back and read them now, and I'm like, wow, I was putting that stuff on Facebook, you know, but it was like, you know, like, when you have an attachment like that, spirits can, like, manipulate how you act, how you feel, you know, all that stuff, and, and thank God I somebody identified it early enough and helped me to take care of it and get rid of it. And, um, you know, I feel like myself again. You know, it's like, it's crazy, but, you know, oh, no. so I'm so thankful for them. Well, Sean, we are so, we wish we actually could talk to you much, 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 much oh, longer. Yeah. And we definitely want to have you on our show because you had us on yours. Absolutely. And that was awesome. And I want to thank you for calling in to our Ghost Stories special. And uh wish and you a happy Halloween. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if you guys if you guys get a chance, um on tomorrow night I'm actually having my Halloween special as well. 
if you guys get a chance, go ahead and call in and, you know, we'll, we'll chat and stuff. So. What time is that going to be? That is going to be at 10 o'clock tomorrow night. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So we should be able to do we that. Already. Yeah. All right. So, you have a good all night, right. I will, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye, right. Yeah. All right. Happy Halloween. Thank you. you. Bye. All right. Bye. Love her. <laughs> All right, next with us we have um, from oh, this. We just lost him. Oh. Oh. Nate, you there? No, he's not there. He's gone. Oh. Nope. Nope. Well, we were going to have Nate with us, but he disappeared as soon as we. <laughs> yeah, we had All a little right. bit of a uh, cross signal going on, and we were going to switch him to another time slot, and uh, we just lost him. So. That's okay. But. Oh, he's back. He's back. Nate? Oh. Hold on. We're going to work out the technical difficulties here. Nate, are you with us? Oh, I am with you. Yay! <laughs> I think we got some paranormal stuff going on with the phones today. You know, as, soon as, as, as soon as your other guest was off, I, um, my, my phone cut right out. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. We have um, Nate. He's from the Seacoast Rep. Um, yeah, the Seacoast Repertory Theater. Um, he was actually on My Ghost Stories uh, with Stirs, um, which is episode 64 that was shown April 21st. No. April 20th. April 20th. Um, so we're going to have Nate tell us his ghost stories real quick. Sure. Um so thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry I, I was supposed to come in a little bit earlier. I'm sorry about this. Again, the technical difficulty of that. But um, but yeah, no. So I uh, I started working at Seacoast Rep um, about I would say four years ago. Um, and I've always been kind of a person that's you know, but I, I like to describe myself as like a romantic skeptic, somebody who really wants to believe in sort of the paranormal. I kind of I grew up really being very, very much interested in it, um, but never really had any sort of experiences happen to me. Um, and it wasn't until I started working at the reps that I started, like, noticing little tiny weird things. Um, my my first experience was uh, when I was in a show, and I, um, was, I was in a show there, and I had these little things, uh, these little guitar picks, that I had that I had to use as a prop for one of my uh, for one of my scenes in the show, and uh, if you're familiar with theater at all, like you know, there's you know two or three entrances you can go onto your stage, and so I was over on stage right, and I was getting ready for my entrance, and I went to go grab my guitar fix, and they're on this little table that I normally would be. Um, everything's very organized backstage because you know you can you have to go on and off in a quick second. So I I go to reach for my guitar fix, and they're gone. Uh, and I look around, and I'm thinking, I go, well, where did somebody take them? You know, where did they go? Um, I went to my, my stage manager. I said, hey, I my guitar picks out where they normally are. Can you tell me where they are? And she said, I, I have no idea. So I grabbed a penny or grabbed a coin or whatever I had in my pocket and used that as a guitar pick for the, for the scene. It wasn't until after the show that I was walking backstage uh, to go to the dressing room, and I noticed, and I found my guitar picks, um, in a neat little pile about 25 feet from where they would have been. Wow. Uh, where, where they should have been. And they were just in a nice, nice, neat little pile like they would be on the table. And so I called my stage manager over and I'm like, is this some sort of joke? Like, why would these be over here? Why, you know, you don't, you don't screw around with props and stuff like that, especially in a professional setting. You shouldn't be, like, you know, moving people's props around because they need them for the show. And she said, uh, I have no idea how those got there. I have literally no idea how those got there. She's like, but it looks like you've met Precocious. And I asked who Precocious was. And she proceeded to tell me that Precocious uh, is the spirit of a little girl that haunts the theater. At that point, I was kind of like, okay, that's, you know, all right. <laughs> you know, kind of laughed at it, kind of, you know, just kind of like was intrigued, but at the same time, kind of like, you know, again, being romantic, romantic skeptic, I was like, I really would like to believe that, but it was probably somebody else, just, you know, it was probably just somebody playing a cool trick. Um, uh, it wasn't until, like, a little bit later on um, when I was working up in the offices, and I got there one day um, early in the morning, and my, my coworker was upstairs, so we were the only two people in the building, 
And I got there early in the morning, and I went upstairs, and, you know, said hi, and put my stuff down, and I had to run down to the box office. And the entrance to the box office is right towards the entrance of the theater in this little sort of inner lobby. And I walked by, and there's nobody in the theater. There's nobody else in the building except for my, my coworker and I. And uh, I, walking by the, the entrance to the theater, I hear this, like, sort of scratching sound, this really loud, like somebody's pushing a push broom across the stage. And the theater security guard would stick my head in, and I'd say, hey, is anyone there? Is anyone there? And the sound stops immediately. Um, and I walk into the theater a little bit more. I start just saying, hey, hello, is anyone there? Is anyone there? And then all of a sudden, it's like this whoosh of, like, cold air, this whoosh, this whole feeling went over my body. And every single hair on my body stood on end. I ran upstairs. I was like, there's something down in the theater. you got to come check it out. My coworker came downstairs. We turned all the lights on. For every single light we put on, there was nobody in there. There was nothing in there but just the two of us. So uh, when Steve had approached uh, my boss uh, and asked if he could come and investigate the theater because he heard about the different stuff at the theater, um, kind of the you know little weird happenings and goings on. We've had you know we've had a couple tours and different people that come through. Roxy uh, Roxy Zwicker has come through a bunch of times on her tours and done stuff. And um, you know how there's actually been a very haunted history to the theater. Um, uh, he said, hey, you know I'd like to come and check the place out. So he went to my boss and said, hey, I would like to you know like to come and check the place out. And I told my boss, he said the only way that I, I would like to I would like to go you know on I would like to go on the investigation with them. Apparently, you know, a lot, a lot of the activity that's been happening lately has been happening while I was around. So I said, let me go on. What do you do? So I went with the Spurs team uh, on the second on their second investigation. The first investigation I was unable to go, but the second investigation I went, and um, I had grown, you know, kind of proficient, uh, I guess, you know, with um, using the EMF reader and. Um, you know, it's kind of sensing when things are starting to get a little odd in the area, like just the shift in energies and stuff like that. So um, I had taught myself how to douse and how to use a pendulum, you know, years ago. Um, again, you know, being a romantic skeptic, believing in all these things, really being intrigued by them, but never really experiencing anything solid. But I brought it with me and so I said, hey, let's, let's do some, you know, let's, let's do some dowsing in this little, in this, this atrium, this sort of weird kind of cave like room that's in this uh, that's in the basement of the theater and I said well you know let's go in here we get a lot of that we get a lot of really strange you know EMF uh, activity in here where we'll have like we'll hold the EMF reader into one particular point of the, of the it's usually in the, the right hand corner of the room we have a really really strong signal and we move it away from that corner and it goes away there's no electricity in that room you have to literally like hold the lamp up when you're in there <laughs> there's nothing in that room so um, yeah <laughs> It's super, it's super, it's like, it's like textbook creaky. It's dark, it's dank, there's water dripping from the ceiling. You know, it's, it's just this really weird room in the middle of nowhere, but in the, like, in, in this, in this uh, basement. And there's also this little boarded up sort of window, sort of tunnel thing that's in there as well. And learning from Roxy that that very much, very much might have been a, um, a, uh, some sort of, some sort of hallway or tunnel or something like that to across the street to add onto the um, add onto the uh, the ocean for when they were doing export because our building is an old brewery. Um, so she said, you know, that might have been up there. But for some reason, there's a lot of really strange activity in this room. So I said, let's let's try with the dowsing or let's, let's do the, uh, the pendulum. And we so started communicating with the spirit in that room, and the pendulum went really, really crazy, and when we asked, when I asked the pendulum to stop, it stopped literally on the line. It stopped yeah. immediately. Wow. So, uh, and you can, you can see the, the, the footage, you know, once you, when you watch the, uh, we have the actual footage and stuff on the, uh, the episode of Michael's story, that footage has been completely untouched. It's been there, and it, it literally, it's going side to side extremely fast, and then literally stopped on a dime. Um, uh, it wasn't until after that that I was kind of walking around and I've been, you know, trying to communicate with Precocious. And so I'm talking to Precocious and talking to her and I have the EMF reader up, you know, you know, ahead of me. I'm a, I'm like a six one, so I'm kind of a tall guy and holding it. And, um, one of Steve's members was filming me and, 
I started to get a lot of really positive. Uh, I started to get a lot of really positive. Um, I guess really positive read from the EMF reader uh, while I was holding it above me, and walking around, asking, you know, asking precocious, you know, if she's a little girl, you know, we have dolls to play with, uh, if she'd like to, you know, sort of like trigger words that would kind of uh, spike the EMF reader. And every time I would get, every time I mentioned dolls or toys or something like that, I would get a really strong response. Um, it wasn't until I kind of put my arm down that I started to get a really strong response. And I thought to myself, if this is the spirit of a little girl, I shouldn't be holding the EMF reader up really high. I should be holding it lower because, you know, in in her physical form, she would have been, you know, shorter. So I put the EMF reader down, and that's when I got every single question that I asked. It, it responded, and it was almost immediately. And it was the same sort of like, like that, you know, just like one, two, three, four, and it would go back down. And then one, two, three, four, and it would go back down after every single question that I asked. And then um, I kind of rounded the corner, uh, and I'm still talking, and all of a sudden I felt this touch, this sort of like whack on my arm. Like not a, <laughs> not like a touch, but like like almost almost like a slap. In a strange way, and you could, I, you could hear it. It was audible. You know, the guy filming was like, "What was that? What was that?" And I, I jumped, I screamed, and I looked, and I had this little tiny red mark on my arm. And I immediately ran out, ran out and on the page. I showed, I showed um, Steve and his team members, and you know, I learned just touched. I was just touched, and the, the the feeling that I had as soon as that happened was like, "I'm going to be sick." Like, <laughs> I know a lot of people describe their feelings of like, you know, where they are. You know, when they have been touched by uh, some sort of entity that they, you know, they either feel extreme sadness or they feel, you know, joy or, or you know, like to have some sort of connection, I felt like I was going to be sick. Like, I felt like I was literally going to throw up. Um, and after that point, I had just been drained of any sort of energy or anything to do anything. So I said, I'm, i got to get out of here. I said, this is, I, I throw the towel in, I'm, I'm done. And, and uh, then- yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off there, man. Um, we're definitely sure, no, running no short on time, and uh, we got like three people in the wings. Um, we would definitely love to get you on an hour show, like I said before. Um, sure, yeah, and, most definitely. And uh, thank you for calling in. We definitely appreciate it. You know that. So, um, oh, yeah, no problem. No, I, I'd be happy to share any more stories. I have, I have plenty more. <laughs> sorry, I had to cut you off. <laughs> we, uh, no worries. We definitely... No, it's totally fine. We definitely want you to uh, totally tell the story, then complete it, and everything on, uh, like we were talking before, about you, on your own show, and that would be awesome. And if anybody's yeah. interested, check out My Ghost Stories, episode 64. Uh, me and Nate and the rest of the STIRS team are uh, are on that episode, and uh, you can definitely see what we've uh, what he was talking about. Good episode. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right, Nate. We wish the best for you. Happy Halloween. Talk to you later. All right. Well. Oh, I just. Oh, I feel bad. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. I wish we had more time for him to share that story. Oh, shit. Hit some alcohol. No. <laughs> Wapatula? No. Oh, no, I definitely that's a good Wapatula. story. Everybody it should actually it watch that. Um, no, I'm story. not saying that. I'm saying because of the... <laughs> All right. <laughs> we got to line it up. We, we um, have with us right now John Tobin, which is the CEO, founder, and lead investigator of Glory Ghost... Um, sorry, Glory Hot Hound. Um, he's the hopes of keeping the spirits alive. And it's also on DCM Wicked Radio. And the John Tobin Show on the A1B Network. <coughs> Sorry. He's been seen on my ghost stories. And also starring in a horror comedy movie, A Grim Becoming, which is coming out in 2014. <laughs> Welcome, John. Hey. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi. I apologize for having you on hold for so long. We, um, we actually have all these great stories and... Yeah. Obviously not enough time for that. <laughs> so if you could, uh, and I hate to ask this quickly, tell us your ghost story, we would greatly yeah, We definitely it. want you on your own show, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you know, you're a scary story. You guys are on the same time as my show. That scares me. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do some sort of 
cool thing or something, but we'll, we'll work it out. Maybe I'll go back to the, the – for me, I've been doing paranormal research for, I don't know, 20-something years, longer than I can think about. But uh, my story goes from, like, uh, my, my uh, encounter with the Holy Grail of paranormal research was a full-time apparition. So it was completely unexpected. But uh, in short, I used to live in this old house. Um, that's when the dad all the time was in the 30s or so, but I don't really know. Unfortunately, I've had trouble tracking down the history of the house. Uh, we had a lot of weird incidents in the house. Um, lights that burst on their own, and TVs going on and off, and door handles and rattle and shake and see them turn, and, and never anybody there. And we had this one situation where toys kept going off on their own. So one time I had a grill, this big grass gas grill that would keep going on with some batteries from it. And after we moved the battery to it, it would still turn on and go off. And then one day we said, we said we've had enough of this to Yeah, thank you for being patient, no and and we'll catch up on another time, okay? Have a happy Halloween. You Same too. To you. 
Wow. John Tobin, oh, everybody. Wow. Awesome yeah. guy. Yeah, very, very, very nice man. Absolutely nice man. Um, one person we have coming on right now, uh, love her to death, it is Litriana Brown. She is the radio show host of Family Spirit on BTVN, co-founder of Paranormal Research Organization of the Southeast. She is a fourth generation ghost hunter. She is also a actress and model and many other things, actually. I could go on and on and on and on and on about her. And she is a sweet southern belle. <laughs> oh. What's going on, Lee, oh, Thank Jenna? you, guys. Hey, y'all, now, how you doing? Good. Oh, we have been busy. <laughs> <laughs> if I had hair, I would pull it all out right now. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Liana, I have five minutes for you to tell us your ghost story, and I wish I had more time, and we definitely need to – I know you had us on your show, so we definitely need to have you on ours um, for your own show as oh, well. Oh, thank you. But go ahead. Tell us your well, ghost story. I have um, had, you know, small experiences, uh, large experiences, you know, all throughout my life. But this is the first one. Uh, the first experience I had, uh, my parents took me on a paranormal investigation, um, largely because I was the one that reported it uh, through some friends of, of mine from school. Uh, there was a uh, nearby uh, orphanage, and there was a report that, uh, remember the, the seesaws on yeah. the playground? Yeah. Like a long board, and you can get on the end. You know, it's just a matter of time before you get hurt on one of those. Either you slide off, and the person on the other side, you know, cracks their tailbone, or the thing comes up and hits you in the chin, or, you know, lots of people have gotten hurt on this. Well, this was one of those times. Um, several years prior, there was a child that had accidentally fallen off the seesaw, and uh, the other child fell, and uh, they were really long boards and the child broke her neck. It was just completely Ooh. an accident, you know, just a playground accident. Everybody loved the girl. Um, she was a year and a half, maybe two years older than me. I mean, it, it just traumatized all of us. But um, several of the other students that were in, in her, um, they had the same den mother and, um, or house mother, um, a lot of those kids were telling me about going on the playground or in their dorm room hearing the seesaw at night. And it was just very traumatizing to hear this, you know. And um, they ended up actually moving from that particular home to another home. And uh, I told my dad about it, and he had done some programs with wildlife and that kind of thing for the um, for this particular orphanage, so they knew him. So he called and said, hey, you know, this is what I've heard. Can we check it out at night after all the children have gone to bed? Well, my mom and dad wouldn't take me on investigations that often because, you know, I already had things happening to me early in life. And uh, so they were, I don't know, my dad was just ultra protective. I don't know. But anyway, he <laughs> just trying to protect me. And, um, you know, I said, look, I want to go. I'm the one that got this one. I want to know what's going on. She was my friend. So um, my dad had one of those old T-Birds, and it was mm-hmm. baby blue, and it had the suicide doors. And it was around Halloween, and it had been warm like the, wa- the weather now. So they had the warm weather, but the cold was coming in, so it created a fog. And the fog was rolling in, and um, my dad said, I want you to stay here. We're going to park on the side of the road. We're going to go over here to this playground. I'm going to do an EVP session. Um, he called it a talk session. And I take a few pictures, and then we might come back later. And um, he said, you're getting sick. I always get sick this time of year. I've got a terrible allergy for ragweed. So um, he said, just stay in the car. We'll leave it running and uh, leave the heat on for you. Well, I fell asleep. I did. I just, I, anytime the wheels turn on a car, even now, luckily I don't drive that often. My husband drives. <laughs> but I fall asleep <laughs> on the road. I just love to ride in the car. So I was out in the back seat, and um, I heard a tapping on my window. And I looked, and I saw a little, a little girl, a hand of a little girl. And um, I thought, oh, my gosh. And I you know, wiped the window, 
And I thought, I saw my friend. And um, I said, Tina, you know, and I opened the door, the suicide door to the back, and I got out of the car, and she wasn't there anymore about that time. The car started rolling into the ditch. <gasps> and a car... And a car oh. came over the cor- over the over the, um, the hill and was coming around the curb, and it was coming right for me. And I felt someone jerk me back. And if the car hadn't rolled, it would have hit us in the rear. And we were on the side of the road. It's just this car was going way too fast and was not very you know steady. And um, I got pulled out of the you know out of the corner of the road so that I wouldn't get hit as well. Wow. And I looked, and my friend was gone. My friend was gone. Wow. And, um, you know, I was just sitting there in the grass, in the dew. The dew had already dropped. Of course, the, you know, the fog was rolling in, and I was crying because, uh, you know, my friend showed me she still loved me. And I was terrified, you know, but I mean, this wreck, you know, almost happened. And, you know, the little hands on the window. I thought I saw my friend in her little dress. She always wore a dress. And, you know, I just thought I saw her. And it was, you know... It wasn't so terrifying as it was. That was my first experience, and it was interactive. I mean, I had seen things. I've always seen things, you know. Mm-hmm. But this particular thing was someone that I had known. It reached out to me in a very special way to protect me. And um, I would just wish I had been there to save her, you know. Yeah. yeah. That's very special. And at least we made, that, we made that very special connection, and, you know, you could play this in a very fearful way, but, you know, all of us ghost hunters, this is more of a special feeling, and it was this time of year. This was my first experience. I was terrified. I was asleep. Right. You know, and somebody knocked on my window, pulled me out of the car, car rolls in the ditch, and a car comes barreling over the hill. I was terrified. Wow. Just proves yeah. that you always have somebody yeah. looking after you. Mm. Well, I... I hope she's doing okay because, you know, I haven't played it very safe. <laughs> she's calling me around to help me. Bless her heart. <laughs> but that's, my, that's my story. I have a couple of others. One that's really, really scary. But with five minutes, this one's probably the best one. Yeah. So, oh, I hope I you guys have a great story. Halloween. You too. Well, thank and, you. And keep those stories for, the, for when we talk to you for the hour show because we definitely want to hear them. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you for having me on my show, and blessings to both of you. All All right. Blessings to you, too. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, Happy Halloween. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Bye-bye. Bye. Love that girl. <laughs> She's so sweet. Woo-hoo. Whoa, Hello. <laughs> Hello. 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 I'd like to welcome our family, our DTM family. Uh, We have with us Tammy Rosenfeld. She is the founder of Salt City Paranormal Investigation and radio show host for Sisterhood (laughs) of Women in the Paranormal. And she has been on hold forever. Yes, God bless her. (laughs) And we also have with us um, the owners of DTM Wicked Radio and producers, and radio show host um, of uh, uh, The Wicked Edge. <laughs> I'm getting tongue tied. Um, and also uh, part of DTM Paranormal Investigations, Benny and Tiffany and, Gager. And a and great maker of a Wapa. Wapa <laughs> Hey! Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. You guys are crazy. <laughs> We're crazy. We are out of our minds right now. You don't even know. <laughs> hey, Tiffany, you can be pretty crazy yourself. <laughs> and cool. I hear Tammy could cool. be pretty crazy, too. Yeah, what's the deal here about the party, girl? <laughs> Did you have a good weekend, <laughs> guys? <laughs> <laughs> no pictures were taken. No, no, no. There were pictures taken. I saw some of them. <laughs> what stays at Tobin stays at Tobin. <laughs> what happens at Tobin? Are you drinking Wapatola? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Tammy, tell us your ghost story. Um, I'll make it brief. I um, have been seeing stuff all my life since I was five years old, but... Um, my family was homeless when I was a teenager, and I had to go live with this family who was into the dark arts, and I saw hooded figures. Wow. 
um, in their house. I saw brown ones and black ones with glowing eyes. And, wow. Um, I used to sleep in the living room on a cot, and they used to surround my cot sometimes. So wow. they were pretty scary. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'll pass on that. Yeah, you'll pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that is scary. That would kind of freak me yeah, out. Yeah, freak yes. you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I was attacked a couple of times by him. So. Really? Whoa. It wasn't. Yeah. Ooh, that's yeah. scary. Hopefully, that's not still happening to you. Yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I said I hope that's not still happening to you. Oh no no no. Um. They did follow me when, once I left that house. They were still around me, and it didn't stop until I started um, getting um, recognizing God in my life and Jesus. Oh, good. Awesome. Yeah. Now, Tiffany, do you have, like, a, a really, 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 really quick story for us? You have, like, three minutes to nap. <laughs> three minutes. Um, Oh, you got it. The house my kind of lives in actually has a really dark experience built in any of the I know some people think that isn't significant, but it is to me. Um, I've never, I have experienced negative things in there, but the worst thing I've ever experienced was actually attacked. So it's the only time I've ever attacked. And I was sleeping in bed. I had to go from work the third shift, so I stayed at my father's house that night. And this was just a couple of years ago. And I remember I was completely wide awake because I was thinking, should I get up early, go get coffee, should I wait for an extra half hour and sleep and then try to get coffee. And all of a sudden, I felt like this hand just pushed my face right into my pillows. And wow. I couldn't breathe. And I tried to scream out for my father. And all of a sudden, my hand let up. And where my room was in my father's house, is you, it's like he was going to call this back. And you can see the shadows. You can see the light reflecting out of the wall. And the cars by, you can see the shadow of the car. Well, Something went by the window, but it wasn't a car. It was the shadow of what looked like a man, a very big man. And wow. it felt so much. I got out of bed. I ran. I took a shower, ran downstairs. And my dad's like, what's wrong? You're like, what is it ghost? I'm like, I was just attacked upstairs. And I explained to him what happened. He goes, the same thing happened to me a couple of nights before. And wow. the negative energy can, you know, affect people. Him and my wicked step monster were fighting. And so I said, it's me. And so I, I think that has something to do with it. But that was the, my worst experience. I was actually physically attacked. And I, I honestly thought for a second there, I was going to take. Wow. wow, that is scary. I have to say, I think that was the quickest story I've ever heard. You talk so fast. That was unbelievable. That was awesome, too. <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> I was like, Wow. We need to we need to do that. That's um, yeah. That was that, that was, was awesome. awesome. Like it was at a, an auction, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> now, before we run out of time, I just want to make make sure that we uh, thank all of our guests. Tonight. Thank you so much. Yes, all, it's been a pleasure. Uh, Fourteen of them, I believe. <laughs> We tried to get them all oh, wait, 13. We actually didn't hear from Denny. But we still love you, Denny. Um, and definitely thank you to all of the people that came. Awesome. <laughs> um, I loved all everybody's stories. We have a few people that are going to be joining us another time. Uh, one of them is Bob Christopher from um, Ghost to Texas. And that will be on the 11th of November. And then on the 25th, we are going to have Lorna Roberts, which uh, she's definitely um, awesome to have as well. Um, we want to real quick play. Everybody, play, you cover your ears for this. This is my daughter. I believe she's going to be a scream queen when she gets older because she had a message to send everybody. So. Yep. This is especially from A-Town. A-Town. <laughs> Happy Halloween! <laughs> She's the cutest little thing. <laughs> she was so excited that she got to contribute something to this show, so I just wanted to put her on there one more time. 
So on behalf of Into the Unknown Realm and DTM Wicked Radio, we hope you all have a very, very happy Halloween. Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Stay spooky. Bye. Oh, hold on. You guys. Oh, hold on. Okay.